black leader of our time was gunned down on February 21st, 1965, at the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem. Who was Malcolm X? What did he stand for? Who killed him? And why? Malcolm X was born Malcolm Little on May 19, 1925, in Omaha, Nebraska. He was one of eight children. His parents moved to Lansing, Michigan when Malcolm was three. His father, Earl Little, was a Baptist minister and a follower of Marcus Garvey. He preached Garvey's message, which was racial pride and the separation from the white race. The KKK warned Little, but he kept on preaching. They burned his house down, but it still didn't stop it. One night, Earl Little went for a walk and didn't come back. They found him with his head crushed in. They finally stopped him. Malcolm's family was extremely poor, and Louise Little tried as hard as she could, but finally had a nervous breakdown and was institutionalized. Malcolm went to his teacher and told him that he wanted to be a lawyer, but the teacher told him that a nigger couldn't be a lawyer and that he should do something with his hands, like the other niggers. Malcolm continually got into trouble and finally got kicked out of school. He went to live with his sister in Boston and quickly started hanging out with the hip crowd. He conked his hair and wore a zoot suit. He parted all night and got high all day. Malcolm got a job on the railroad and loved going to the big cities like New York, and Washington, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. He got heavily into drugs and prostitution and even started stealing to support his cocaine habit. He went on a Christmas stealing spree in Boston with a bunch of his friends in December 1945 and was arrested in a Boston jewelry store on January 12th when he tried to reclaim a stolen watch he left for repair. Malcolm was sentenced to prison and started serving time on February 27, 1946. While in prison, he started visiting the library and reading everything he could, including the dictionary. Malcolm's brother introduced him to the teachings of Elijah Muhammad in 1947, and Malcolm converted to the Nation of Islam. He was paroled from state prison on August 7, 1952, and went to live in Detroit where he started working at a furniture store managed by his brother, Wilfred. He went to Chicago to hear Elijah Muhammad speak and received his ex on August 31, 1952. Malcolm was named Assistant Minister of Detroit Temple No. 1 and became First Minister of Boston Temple No. 11 in 1953. He preached the teachings of Elijah Muhammad 
Yes, we hate laziness. We hate drunkenness. We hate uh, dope addiction. We hate nicotine. We hate all the vices that the white man has taught us to partake in. And he accuses us of hating him. Who are you? You don't know. Don't tell me Negro, that's nothing. What were you before the white man named you a Negro? And where were you? And what tongue did you speak? How did the man take your tongue? Where is your history? How did the man wipe out your history? How did the man, what did the man do to make you as dumb as you are right now? If you can't do for yourself, what the white man is doing for himself, don't say you're equal with the white man. Right. If you can't set up a factory like he sets up a factory, don't talk that old equality talk. This uh, truth that makes us to know the white man as he is. It is not uh, 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 other than the truth. It's just the real truth. We never did know the real truth. So now we know the white man as he is. And if the white man says, that I am teaching hatred, it is just to say, I didn't want you to tell them who I was. The same God didn't make the white man that made us. The white man made just 6,000 years ago, and we was made uh, uh, unlimited. We don't know nothing about any birth record to us. And you can't find no history that will give you the birth of the black man. He has always been. We call Mr. Muhammad a hate teacher because he makes your hate dope and alcohol. They call Mr. Muhammad a black supremacist because he teaches you and me not only that we're as good as the white man, but better than the white man. Yes, better than the white man. You are better than the white man. And that's not saying anything. That's not saying, you, have, you know where just to be equal with him. Who is he to be equal with? We turn to drugs because we're trapped. We turn to drugs and alcohol seeking an escape from the heaven that the white man has trapped us in here in America. We're trapped. We know no way out. So we get a wine bottle. We get a whiskey bottle. Or we stick a needle in our arm. Or we smoke pot. Trying to find an escape from the hell that the white man has given us for 400 years here in America. So this is a false escape. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is offering a real escape. A, not, not only a a real estate, but a real escape right here on this earth. We cannot deal with the American white man's army and uh, his science of uh, modern warfare. We can't compete with it. So therefore, if we are dissatisfied, <coughs> we have to take our dissatisfaction to one who can deal with him effectively. And that's God personal political philosophy is black nationalism, which means that the black man should control the politics of his own community and control the politicians who are in his own community. My personal economic philosophy is uh, also black nationalism. Abraham Lincoln tricked the so-called Negro into thinking that he was free, and when you uh, read some of the books that were written by the so-called Negro historian J.E. Rogers, one of his books, God, uh, The Africa's Gift to America, he points out plainly how Abraham Lincoln did nothing but trick the Negro, fool the Negro, and use the Negro, the same as every other politician who has been in the White House has been tricking and fooling and using the Negro as a political football ever since America has been America. Our desire, our prayer, that we can have a peaceful, intelligent rally here this afternoon. But at the same time, we see that they have surrounded us with many of their own agents in uniform and out of uniform who have spent much time here in Harlem posing as peace officers and at the same time breaking up the peace of black people. So we hope that they will be peaceful and we will be peaceful. 
We are here to tell you to love the white man. You have come to the wrong place. And those of you who think that you perhaps came here to hear us tell you to turn the other cheek to the brutality of the white man, I say again, you came to the wrong place. But no matter what happens, we don't teach you to turn the other cheek. We don't teach you to turn the other cheek in the south, and we don't teach you to turn the other cheek in the north. We teach you to obey the law. We teach you to carry yourselves in, in a respectable way. But at the same time, we teach you that anyone who puts his hand on you, do your best to see that he doesn't put it on anybody else. You don't have any vote for airplanes bringing drugs into this country. The white man brings it in. The white man brings it to Harlem. The white man makes you a drug addict. The white man then puts you in jail when he catches you using drugs. Who is it that controls the prostitution in Harlem? It's the white man. Who controls the large nut sale of whiskey and wine? It's the white man. You don't have any distillery. You don't own Shinley's. You don't own uh, Old Ever Hope or Seagram. You don't put the seal on that bottle of whiskey. It's the white man. Who gives you the deck of cards and the dice that you use to gamble with? It's the white man. And after he sent them to you, he catch you with them and put you in jail for using them. <laughs> You're trapped in a vicious cycle of poverty, of ignorance, of apathy, of disease, and of death. And they have these old Uncle Tom Negro leaders coming to Harlem telling you and me that times are getting better. Your times will never get better until you make them better. We love to see anything that goes on right here in Harlem. They will, they will let a prostitute buy as long as she come back to them later on. They encourage her to be a prostitute. They take bribes from her for being a prostitute. And they'll take it in cash or they'll take it in trade. Well, we're here to tell them it has to come to a stop. Anytime you find any white man taking advantage of your woman, disrespecting her, you're within your right to do the same thing to him that he's been doing to you. You can't take a white woman in a white neighborhood. You can't grab a white woman in a white neighborhood. You can't even walk through a white neighborhood with a white woman. Well, what do you look like letting this blue-eyed thing walk around here with our women? Comes to biting the enemy of, of America, you'll bite just like that. Whether he tell you to bite in Korea or bite in Berlin or bite in the South Pacific. As soon as he says stick them, you'll bite anybody he point the finger at. But right here in this country, right in this country, under your nose, with two-legged white dogs, sick and four-legged dogs on your and my mother. You and I don't know how to fight. Sick and dogs on your and my sister. And you and I don't know how to fight. Sick and dogs on our children and dogs on our babies. And you don't know how to fight. You can't fight nor bark until the white man say bark or bite. In the South, you are segregated by that dog. In the North, you integrated with this dog. And it's no different. Oh, you're not getting too wet. Well, the dog is their best friend. The dog is their closest relative. They got the same kind of hair, the same kind of skin, and the same kind of smell. Oh, yeah. And Adam Clayton Powell knows it. He knows you can send him to Washington or you can send him to Puerto Rico. <laughs> and because he knows it, he speaks with a loud voice like a black man. And when he speaks with a loud voice like a black man, the white man calls him a racist. So he sounds too much like a Muslim. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
simply because he's trying to tell the white man where it's at. When the Honorable Elijah Muhammad finishes opening your and my eyes and making it possible for us to see this white man like he really is, he don't have to worry about us integrating with him. We don't want to be around that old tale thing. We don't want to be around that old tale thing. We don't want to integrate with that old tale thing. We don't want to sleep next to that old tale thing. So we can do without it. You find that old tale thing, lean out in the sun, trying to get to look like you. That old tale thing. You find him using man pants. Trying to look like you. That old tail thing. That old sickly looking thing. And today we see him like he is. There was a time when we used to drool in the mouth over white people. We thought they were pretty because we were blind. We were dumb. We couldn't see them as they are. But since the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has come and taught us the religion of Islam, which has cleaned us up, and made us so we can see for ourselves. Now we can see that old pale thing to look exactly as he looked. Nothing but an old pale thing. Citation is the name given to the uh, uh, quality of the man. Uh, it means uh, originally uh, weak bone and stale face. You know, uh, the person have a stale color, and his bones are weak, and they call him Caucasian. But uh, actually, he was made white. Uh, this was brought about 6,000 years ago. And a black man, uh, uh, he is the father of the Caucasian race. His name was Yaku. He uh, discovered in the germ of the black man that there were two people. And instead in the germ, he uh, learned to divide the germ. It taken him 600 years to keep marrying this lighter one on to the lighter one uh, until he produced the, we say, they pick up the whole thing. That is pale white. He did it by birth, uh, uh, using the birth control law. Therefore, and uh, uh, we have today now a brown race, yellow race, and a red race, and a white race. And the black is the original. He's the father of, of them all. We have no desire to integrate with a race of people who are cruel enough to sick dogs on women, children, and babies. We don't want to have anything to do with any race, any race of dogs, two-legged dogs, that will sick four-legged dogs on innocent, harmless women, children, and babies. Uh, it's not a case of taking militant action against the police department. As I said earlier, we obey the law. We respect the law more than many of the police officers do. As you, Mr. Muhammad has reformed more uh, lawbreakers. He has re rehabilitated uh, more uh, Negroes with criminal de uh, tendencies than the police department itself has. And he, the Muslims in Harlem have done more to bring about respect of law and order than the police department in Harlem has. And I've had police officials in New York City at the top level admit this. So it's not a case of taking militant action against any police. It's a case of letting the police and anyone else who's involved know that we are human beings, we are men, and we will uh, stand like men and defend ourselves like men. My personal economic philosophy is uh, also black nationalism, which means that the black man should have a hand in controlling the economy of the so-called Negro community. He should be developing the type of knowledge that will enable him to own and operate the businesses and thereby be able to create employment for his own people, for his own kind. And the uh, social philosophy also is black nationalism, which means that instead of the black man trying to force himself into the society of the white man, we should be trying to eliminate from our own society the ills and the, the defects and make ourselves uh, likable and sociable among our own kind.
Do you consider yourself militant? <laughs> I consider myself Malcolm. <laughs> we are peaceful people. We are loving people. We love everybody who loves us. But we don't love anybody who doesn't love us. We're nonviolent with people who are nonviolent with us. But we are not nonviolent with anyone who is violent with us. The Muslims who have accepted the religion of Islam and follow the religious guidance of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have never bombed any churches, have never murdered any little girls, as was done in Birmingham, have never lynched anybody, have never at any time been guilty of initiating any aggressive acts of violence during the entire uh, 33 years or more uh, that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been teaching us. The charge of violence against us actually stems from the guilt complex that exists in the conscious and subconscious minds of most white people in this country. They know that they've been violent in their brutality against Negroes. And they feel that someday the Negro is going to wake up and try and do unto them as they have done unto, do unto the whites as the whites have done unto us. We are a violent group. We do, uh, we are taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to be, to obey the law, to respect everyone who respects us. We're taught to display courtesy, to be polite. But we're also taught that at any time, anyone in any way uh, inflicts or seeks to inflict violence upon us, we are within our religious rights to retaliate in self-defense to the maximum degree of our ability. We never initiate any violence upon anyone. But if anyone attacks us, we reserve the right to defend ourselves. So to accuse us of, of being violent is like accusing a man who is being lynched, who is being hung on a tree, uh, simply because he struggles vigorously against his lyncher. The victim is accused of violence, but the lyncher is never accused of violence. And I only point this out because the various racist groups that are set up in this country by whites, and who have actually practiced violence against blacks for 400 years are never associated or identified or made synonymous with the term violence. But whites speak of Muslims almost synonymously with violence. Whenever Muslims are mentioned by them, violence is brought up. But, not, but it's not connected with any other group. This is a sort of a propaganda tactic or what I would call psychological warfare to uh, in some way make uh, the image of the Muslims in this country be a violent image rather than a religious image. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to ask a question in that regard. What's interesting is that uh, members of the Nation of Islam have not used violence even when uh, black Americans were attacked. Uh, how do you account for this? Does this in any way contradict uh, some of the basic premises of your movement? I don't know how you mean. Well, you maintain, for example, that, that you will not or that you should not use violence unless you are attacked by the white man. And I think we can note in the last several years, certainly, dozens and dozens and dozens of instances in which Negroes have been uh, attacked, uh, killed in some instances. You mean in these demonstrations? These demonstrations and, and the bombings, for example, recently in Birmingham where they killed four little Negro girls. And what interests me is the fact is, is that the Nation of Islam has not done anything to retaliate. I think you should be happy. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. The important thing is, does your lack of action no, contradict any no, of your basic principles? Uh, I'll explain it. You should be happy that Muslims who follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, number one, don't believe in any form of integration and, who be and, and believe that every mention of the word integration by whites, whether it be from the mouth of Kennedy on down to the mouth of the lowest, raggediest white liberal in the street who is 
beatnik-like involving himself in these integration efforts. If we believed in it, we would integrate and we would fight anybody who got in our way or made any effort whatsoever to stop us from integrating. Mm -hmm. If we really believe that the law of the land, the Supreme Court, and other so-called judicial bodies were for real uh, when they talked about integration, we would integrate. <coughs> and knowing that the law was on our side, and any effort we made to demonstrate toward integration, why we would know the law should be on our side, uh, if it's the law of the land. If it is the law of the land, then the demonstrators are within the law. And the uh, uh, discriminators are against the law. Mm -hmm. But to show you the hypocrisy of the law, when Negroes demonstrate for integration, instead of uh, arresting the discriminators, the law arrests the demonstrators. So this is a foolish move on the part of Negroes. Mm -hmm. And when you foolishly get yourself involved with a, a, an enemy, then whatever comes upon you, that's your business. As Muslims, we believe that separation is the best way and the only sensible way, not integration. And on, But on the other hand, when we see our people being brutalized by white bigots, white racists, uh, we think that they are foolish to allow themselves to be beaten and brutalized and do nothing whatsoever to protect themselves. They are foolish. They, they, they should have the right to, de to defend themselves against any attack made against them by anyone. If a dog is biting a black man, the black man should kill the dog. Whether the, do the dog is a police dog, a hound dog, or any kind of dog. If a dog is sick on a black man, when that black man is doing nothing but trying to uh, take advantage of what the government says is supposed to be his, then that black man should kill that dog or any two-legged dog who sticks the dog on it. Should other black men help that particular person who was attacked? I think you'll find, sir, that there will come a time when black people wake up and become intellectually independent enough to think for themselves, as other humans are intellectually independent enough to think for themselves, then the black man will think like a black man. And he will feel for other black people. And this new thinking and feeling will cause black people to stick together. And then at that point, you'll have a situation where when you attack one black man, you are attacking all black men. And this type of black thinking will cause all black people to stick together. And this type of thinking also will bring an end to the brutality inflicted upon black people by white people. And it is the only thing that will bring an end to it. No federal court, state court, or city court will bring an end to it. It's something that the black man has to bring an end to himself. Minister Malcolm, let me, on the basis of your two remarks, ask uh, a, a double-pronged question. One, is it then your assertion that the laws res with respect to how Negroes are supposed to have equal opportunity and equal rights in this country are not meaningful or believed by whites? And secondly, what is then is your opinion and attitude toward the civil rights movement in general, and particularly uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King and his philosophy of nonviolent and direct action? If uh, the white people really passed meaningful laws, it would not be necessary to pass any more laws. There are already enough laws on the law books to protect an American citizen. You only need uh, additional laws when you're dealing with someone who is not regarded as an American citizen. But whites are so hypocritical. They don't want to admit that this black man is not a citizen. Uh, so they classify him as a, a second-class citizen to, uh, to get around uh, making him a real citizen. If he was a real citizen, you'd need no more laws. You'd need no civil rights legislation. Uh, civil rights, is, uh, when you have civil rights, you have citizenship. It's automatic. White people don't need laws to protect their citizenship because they're citizens. But they, want, they, uh, they don't want to tell us we're not citizens. And at the same time, 
They don't want to pass laws that are meaningful enough to protect us as if we were citizens. And the Supreme Court desegregation decision is the best example I know. That's a law from the Supreme Court. Ten years have gone by. No, no desegregated schools. It hasn't been implemented beyond, I think, 9% in 10 years. So this just shows you the hypocrisy of the American white man. They talk out of both sides of their mouth. And uh, for this reason, we who are Muslims, that is, who believe in the religion of Islam, who believe in God, we don't believe that black people will ever get any laws, get any problem with laws being passed or uh, new persons being put in office, uh, white liberals being put in office. There is nothing that the white man will ever do to bring about uh, true, sincere uh, citizenship or civil rights recognition for black people in this country. Nothing will they ever do. They will always talk it, but they won't practice it. And uh, with the Supreme Court, if the NAACP can tell me that they want a desegregation decision for me uh, 10 years ago, but yet the schools haven't been desegregated, as I say, this is a victory with no victory. Uh, it's a victory that you can talk about, but it's a victory you can't show me. So if you represent the NAACP and you are telling me about this great victory you won for me, when I look at you, I have to uh, conclude that either you have been duped yourself or else you are trying to dupe me. And in most instance, instances where the civil rights struggle is involved, there is no civil rights leader can point to me one concrete gain, practical gain, that black people have made in the civil rights field in this country, not only during the past 10 years, but during the past 100 years. Now, the other part was uh, with respect to Mr. King and the nonviolent direct action. Well, I will let uh, uh, Jimmy Baldwin and John Killens and Lou Lomax, the writers, answer that. Uh, uh, speaking right after these, this church was bombed, in Birmingham, Christian Church was bombed in Birmingham by Christians too, mind you. And these four little girls were murdered. Uh, John Killens and James Baldwin and uh, Lomax and the Negro writers and actors had a meeting at the town hall in New York. And Killen pointed out concerning these murders of these little girls, said the killings had raised doubts about the intelligence of the nonviolent uh, of nonviolence in the civil rights struggle. He went on to declare that he could no longer be asked to love those who persecuted and killed Negroes. He also, uh, and the writer, uh, Mr. Handler, who's, who's uh, describing this, said that Killens, it was not clear concerning Killens, Killens' remarks to his audience that he was breaking with the, it was clear, rather, to his audience that he was breaking with the doctrine of the Reverend Martin Luther King's uh, uh, philosophy that as Christians, Negroes should love their fellow man in a truly religious sense. Now, James Baldwin, speaking on that same platform, said, and I was present during this entire affair, asserted that the American people shared a collective guilt for the persecution of Negroes, much as Germans did because of their silence during the Nazi persecution. He denounced President Kennedy for what he termed Kennedy's lack of passion in the civil rights struggle. Mr. Baldwin said that there could no longer be a Republican Party for the Negro people as long as it listed a Barry Goldwater, nor a Democratic Party for the Negro people with a Senator Eastland on its roster. He asserted that the federal government acted swiftly and energetically, that unless the federal government acted swiftly and energetically, future slaughter would make Birmingham look like a dress rehearsal. I, and now, how, what do I think about uh, King's uh, attitude? King's right-hand man, uh, Wyatt Walker, at King's convention, according to the New York Times on September the 26th, said, we had, quote, we have been duped, meaning these persons involved in the civil rights struggle, of which King is the symbolic leader. His right-hand man says, and I quote, we have been duped, or have duped ourselves, into believing that the chains have been broken, when in truth we have only been chained more securely. Half freedom has in many instances been worse than no freedom at all. Why, don't ask me what I think about their struggle. I can tell you what they think about their struggle. And they, have, and they are, are, are pointing out that it is becoming more difficult every day uh, for the civil rights leaders to keep the masses of black people uh, nonviolent and uh, long-suffering and patient and keep them from becoming disenchanted. I hope that answers your question. What is 
the definition of freedom, justice, and equality for the black man, and where and when is it to be attained? Well, take equality first. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad doesn't teach us to uh, associate equality with whites. Equality has nothing to do with whites. We, want e we don't want to be equal with the white man. He's not the criteria or yardstick by which equality is measured. He's not in a position to tell us we are equal. It's not his right, it's not his to do. Equality, we want equality. We had equality before the white man was created. We had, the, we had equality before the white man came into existence. And we want equality whether the white man is on this earth or not. Equality means the uh, opportunity to develop all of our dormant potential, all, all of our dormant capability. And, and, and uh, in developing this dormant uh, capability, the right and the ability to stand on this earth on some land uh, of our own and bring about a civilization and a society in, we will, in which we will be completely independent, complete freedom to uh, uh, take care of the needs, to take care of the uh, wants and the likes and the dislikes of our people, to establish our own nation, our own society, our own heaven, our own future. This is what we mean by freedom, by uh, equality, and justice means uh, as you sow, so shall you reap. If you do wrong, you'll get wrong in return. And if you do right, you'll get right in return. When you're in your own nation, in your own land, you're in a position to get justice. But when you're in another man's country, in another man's land, under another man's flag, and under another man's uh, 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 government, and under another man's court system, you have to look to that other man for justice, and you'll never get it. And Negroes in this country probably are authorities on that. Yeah. To what extent does this formulation approach that expounded by Zionists? Uh, they, for example, many Zionists, Zionists maintain they could never expect uh, justice in the Zionist courts and, and the, the courts found in other countries in Eastern Europe and so on. And they decided that it would be wise to establish a separate state in, in Israel. And, there, and, there, and all of the world powers got together, the white world powers, I should mm -hmm. say, got together and helped all of these white Jews to establish a separate state uh, in the heart of a dark-skinned people's territory. Uh, and if white people can get together and, and, and let other whites, help other whites uh, to establish uh, an independent nation right in the midst of dark-skinned people, and then we see, we don't see where white people should be so much against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's solution not of the setting up an independent dark nation in a white people's property, but he's asking uh, uh, the opportunity to set up an independent nation in our own, on our own continent. Let us leave America and go back home among our own people on our own land and set up our own independent society. But all he says is that this government which made us slaves should supply the transportation for us to get back home and give us all of the machinery and the tools necessary for us to till the soil and establish our own agricultural system to feed and clothe our people, our own economy, and in some way become an independent people among our own people on our own continent. This is intelligent, and Zionists should never criticize us. You say then that the United States is not the black man's country, Definitely American not. laws no, are no. not black men's laws. No. I, uh, American laws are not the black man's laws. Well, the, the uh, laws here in America were made white, by white people for the benefit of white people. The Constitution was written by whites for the benefit of whites. It was never written for the benefit of blacks. And, and when you read the Constitution, I think in Article 1, se uh, Section Article one, section 2, or Section 1, Article 1, some one of the two, and it's in the Constitution, it says that uh, it classifies black people as three-fifths of a man. Three-fifths of a man, subhuman, less than a human being. It relegates us to the level of cattle, hogs, chickens, cows, a commodity that could be bought and sold at the will of the master. No, it was written by whites for the benefit of whites and to the detriment of blacks. And when a black man stands up talking about his constitutional rights, he's out of his mind. Now, Mr. Malcolm, in our textbook, which the students have read, supposedly, there is a statement, which is a quotation from Essien and essentially that from uh, Lincoln, to the effect that uh, 
the nation of Islam does not have a great deal of support in the Negro community in this country by and large. And a recent national poll of American Negroes found that leaders and rank and file, according to their statistics, supported the Reverend Martin Luther King somewhere over 90%, whereas the support and favorable rating that they gave Minister Muhammad was less than 20%, and somewhere around 45% of them gave an unfavorable rating to Mr. Muhammad. What would your response be in terms of Baldwin's statement that this is a growing thing and the kinds of evidence that we have that there isn't much to it? Well, uh, that, that statement I made just made concerning the Constitution is Article 1, Section 2 in the Constitution where it classifies us as chattel. Uh, Baldwin did point out that Mr. Muhammad has the only grassroots support and is the only one whose whole the following operates or functions on a mass vehicle. Uh, and, and I think Baldwin told Dr. Kenneth Clark that uh, Martin Luther King is at the end of his rope. Now, uh, concerning the uh, poll taken by Newsweek magazine, I think you said that this was the leaders who said that, uh, who went with King and against Mr. Muhammad around 90%. I just told you a little while ago, these leaders that they call leaders, this included Lena Horne, this included Dick Gregory, and this included comedians, comics, trumpet players, baseball players. Show me in the white community where a comedian is a white leader. Show me in the white community where a singer is a white leader, or a dancer or a trumpet player is a white leader. These aren't leaders. These are puppets and clowns that uh, have been set up over the white community and uh, over the black community by the white community and have been made celebrities and usually say exactly what uh, they know that the white man wants to hear. And it is an honor, actually, that they endorse Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, uh, were against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's actually an honor. Now, when you say that they also, in the same Newsweek poll magazine, they, uh, I think the pollster said that he went into the Negro community and asked about the Muslims. And many Negroes whom he asked said, well, I never heard of the Muslims. Who are they? You know, this is the rank and file we're talking about. Oh, yeah. About. Now, when they got down to the rank and file, this was the answers that they got. Uh, this is equivalent to uh, the situation in Kenya during the Mau Mau uprising when many uh, frightened uh, whites in Kenya, Africa, would go among the Africans and ask them, what about the Mau Mau? And the African would say, I never heard of them. And the same white man who would ask the African this question and very naively believe what the African said, when he went to bed that night, he would lose his head. And usually the one who took his head was the same African who told him that afternoon he had never heard of the Mau Mau. Uh, except uh, in the Newsweek poll, they used Negro interviewers. You'll find that oftentimes Negroes are as much on guard uh, around Negro interviewers who usually represent the bourgeois uh, element of Negroes as they are on guard around whites. Uh, usually Negroes know that when this bourgeois Negro walks through the door, he is not doing something that he's initiated himself, but he's involved in something in which the white man is the absolute author of and has sent him to the Negro community for some information. And when they give that Negro some information, usually they give him the information that they want the white, want him to take back to the white man, because that's who he's going to take it back to. One more minute. Uh, our time is just about up, Minister Malcolm, and uh, perhaps you could summarize and conclude by giving us, in your opinion, or in the opinion of Mr. Elijah Muhammad, what would be the ideal solution to the racial problem in the United States today? Well, on Thursday, October the 3rd, the New York Tribune, in an editorial, pointed out in Boston, in an article called The Civil Rights Iceberg, they pointed out how Kennedy had realized that beneath the water, the civil rights uh, whole problem uh, was political suicide. Because in his own hometown, the head of the Board of Education, a woman named Mrs. Uh, Hicks, was running against the NAACP philosophy, and she swept aside all other opposition. The whole white community supported her in opposition to the NAACP's desire for integrated schools, integrated housing, and otherwise. So I say that to say this, that even the Jewish community, community which is supposed to be pro-liberal, went against the NAACP. Whites are against integration in practice, but they're for it in principle. So the only solution is separation. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that this can be brought about 
simply by letting our people be exposed to the truth about ourselves, about the white men, about our history and our condition in this country. And once we are exposed to the complete truth as things about things as they actually exist in this country, the masses of black people will choose complete separation from this entire system, political system, economic system, social system, and whatever other aspect or description you, or, or uh, uh, adjective you want to attach to it. Let us go back home to our own people, live among our own kind, and solve our own problems ourselves. And if the white man doesn't want us to go back to our own people and live in our own country, then since we can't get along together in peace on this country with white people, let us separate part of this continent, migrate to that separate territory, let the government give us everything we need to establish our own independent economic system and society, and thereby we'll be able to solve our own problems ourselves and prove that we are human beings and a part of the human family and can do for ourselves what other humans have done for themselves. And then we'll be able to stop blaming the white man for what he has done and stop begging the white man to solve our problems. We'll be able to solve our problems ourselves. Thank you very much. That's it. President Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963. On December 1st, a Nation of Islam rally in New York, Malcolm said that, quote, the chickens have come home to roost, unquote, meaning that the whites had created a climate of hate and got repaid for it. This was against the orders of Elijah Muhammad, who specifically told Malcolm not to comment on the assassination. People got disturbed at Malcolm's comment, and Elijah suspended Malcolm for 90 days. This statement from Messenger Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Muslims of America. Uh, Minister Malcolm Shabazz addressing a public meeting at Manhattan Center in New York City on Sunday, December the 3rd, did not speak for the Muslims when he made comments on the death of the president, John F. Kennedy. He was speaking for himself and not Muslims in general. And Minister Malcolm has been suspended from public speaking for the time being. Uh, Mr. Muhammad's correct statement on hearing of the death of the president was as follows. We with the world are very shocked at the assassination of our president. And the nation still mourns the loss of our president. And he has said that it seems that every president who speaks out on behalf of the Negro has been assassinated from Lincoln to President Kennedy. This is the December 20th, 1963 issue of Muhammad Speaks, published every two weeks in Chicago. On page three, this item appeared. It's a report that Elijah Muhammad, from his home in Phoenix, telephoned the newspaper ordering that a statement be placed on page one. The report goes on to say that the paper had already gone to press and that the statement could not be published until two weeks later in the next edition. The statement reads, We with the world are very shocked at the assassination of our president. Meanwhile, a widely publicized statement about the assassination had been made by Malcolm X, then chief public spokesman for the Muslims. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad responded by suspending Malcolm and publishing this statement. When Minister Malcolm addressed the public and mentioned the president's death, he did not speak for Muslims. He was speaking for himself and not for Muslims in general. He has been suspended from public speaking for the time being. The nation still mourns the loss of our president. Malcolm's statement was that the assassination was a case of the chickens coming home to roost. Malcolm has since left the Muslim organization and has established his own organization in Harlem. Malcolm uh, uh, actually uh, was discovered long before he was suspended. I only suspended for a time. I only tried him because I knew that he was not going to accept it. And I said, just keep quiet for 90 days. And he would not do it. And I knew he would not do it because he felt that he would be losing his prestige. Malcolm has claimed that many of your followers have left and chosen to follow him and his organization. That's no truth at all. Malcolm has left, all, uh, <coughs> left his own uh, organization and teaching. Uh, and uh, in fact about it, we don't see where that we have missed any of our followers by Malcolm's deviation. 
he, in fact about it, uh, has increased our followers. We uh, have more followers today than we had when Malcolm was with us. And we have more unity than we had when Malcolm was with us. Well, I would say generally throughout the country, because of the pronouncements of some of their leaders, it's a matter that we are watching uh, for any uh, uh, violation of the law, uh, of the federal law. Uh, it's a matter that is uh, uh, being watched at the present time by the Department of Justice. The FBI were watching Malcolm wherever he went. They even bugged his phones. Malcolm returned the favor on February 4th, 1964 when two FBI agents paid him a visit at his house and tried to bribe him for information on the Nation of Islam. Malcolm had a tape recorder on his couch and taped the whole conversation. It's probably what you uh, assume we, we came for to obtain any information you want to give us about the Muslims. Uh, I don't understand anything. No. <laughs> I, that's a very general statement on my part, but uh, as you know, uh, Uh, plans, the programs. Uh, no teaching is more public 
than ours. And I don't think you find anybody more blunt in being in public than we do. No, exactly. That's, I don't think you can go anywhere on this earth and find anybody who expresses their views on matters more candidly than we do. Uh, I don't agree with you. No, that's right. Yeah, you're right. You do. The, the main thing is uh, there is a certain area of responsibility. This is getting into our uh, angle of it. What we really want is are the names of all those who belong. The names of who they are. The identification. I don't even know them. Uh, you have. Do you keep no records? I'm not. It's not my job. I'm just a preacher. Yeah. But somebody out there keeps the record. I don't know who. I don't have any knowledge of those kinds of things. With all the other responsibilities I've had, it's, it's difficult for me to worry about names. Plus, yeah. you would insult my intelligence. Asking me for them. You, you, I mean, in fact, no, you would insult your own because uh, it would mean that your own intelligence isn't heavy enough to weigh me and know in advance what I'm going to say when you ask that question. Well, without getting into the argument on semantics there, you don't know until you ask. That's not uh, semantics. Uh, <laughs> that again goes into your psychology. We've had people that, uh, not this group in particular, other groups. Oh, yes. Who have been just as vociferous against what we're, whatever we're investigating as a communist. Make, that, make a good uh, mm -hmm. case out of it. Communists for 20 years, you know, they hate everything. Uh, go interview them. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to. Go anyway. So you go and knock them door and go, Where have you been? Oh, I want to tell you something. You never know that you ask. And that's happened so many times. Um, sometimes uh, you, the word isn't convinced, but sometimes you. Uh, money brings out uh, the information. Uh, I know. Intend to insult you here. According to Dillon, uh, what's his name, the Secretary of Treasury? This, yeah, the right. money, this government's money is in such trouble until... You can still spend it. Uh, <laughs> still, according to uh, your government economy, the dollar itself is in such trouble, a person would be a fool to sell his soul for one of these decreasing dollars. Oh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. You'd be a fool to sell your soul if the dollar was increasing. Uh, so this has nothing to do with selling your soul. I mean, if you look at it that way, okay. Yeah, but depends on how you look at it. Sure. You insult my intelligence. When they, not only they insult me, period. But they think I would tell them anything. But uh, it, 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 would, uh, it would be good. And I think uh, in, in many ways it might uh, might be of some benefit to your organization. You know, if, yes. if in fact we can eliminate People. There's no government agency that can ever expect any information out of me that's in any way detrimental to any religious group or black group, for that matter, in this country. No government agency. That's fine. Because they should use that same energy to go and find who bombed that church down there in Alabama. Well, and if, they, if, if the government, if these government agencies spend as much money and time and energy, you know what somebody in the South is saying today? If you people would go up north and investigate the Muslims with the same energy you're trying to find this bomb here. The Muslims don't bomb churches. I know. I know they say that. But still, the Muslims don't bomb churches in North. If we broke law, they have us in jail tomorrow. Malcolm joined Cassius Clay's camp and hung around as Clay trained for his heavyweight fight with Sonny Liston. Yeah, I've had 180 amateur fights, world Olympic gold medal winner in Rome, Italy, two-time United States Golden Glove champion, two-time United States AAU champion, Pan American champion, Diamond Bell champion, uh, a world stock and ranking heavyweight, and I'm as pretty as you and you're not a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> so when the gong rings and the referee sings out, the winner and Sonny Liston will fall, Cassius Clay will be the noblest Roman of them all. Clay was an 8-1 to underdog, but beat Liston and became the new heavyweight champion of the world.
couldn't even get a good make him him in the hospital. Put him in the hospital. He's never been stopped. He's never been wrong. Oh, I'm so great. Oh, I'm so great. Oh, I shook up. And what makes it so good? All of these hypocrites. You can't call it a fit. You can't call it a fit. Because of, I didn't stop the fight. The doctor had to stop it. Oh, I'm so pretty. I shook up the world. After the fight, Clay announced to the world that he had converted to the Nation of Islam and he changed his name to Muhammad Ali. Malcolm was asked about his relationship with Cassius. Malcolm X, may I call you that? Certainly. Malcolm X, I, uh, I want to talk with you briefly about your affiliation with Cassius. How long have you known him? About three years. And have you been advising him uh, as far as his religious affiliations are concerned? Well, no, I don't give advice to anyone. He's my brother and my friend. I express what I know and understand around him, and then, but he has a mind of his own, an understanding of his own. Did he feel that, uh, he tells me that he felt that his affiliation with the Muslim religion had a great deal to, to do with his winning? Yes, uh, as a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the religion of Islam, it definitely had, uh, had everything to do with his victory. It gave him the confidence that uh, was necessary to be the winner. Malcolm X, you were involved in a controversy some months ago with your leader. Is that over? Well, I've been, I've been silent for the past 90 days because of uh, some statements I made concerning the President of the United States, uh, which were distorted. They were distorted. And yes, and, what did you say, and, Malcolm? Well, I said the same thing that everybody says, that uh, his assassination was the result of the climate of hate. But only, I, not... only, only I said the chickens came home to roost, and, which means the same thing. Uh, uh, climate of hate means that this is, this is the result of something. And when I said chickens coming home the roof, I mean, uh, chickens coming home the roof, I said the same thing. But did you did you did not say that you were glad the president was killed? No, that's what the press said. Uh -huh. What would I look like saying that I'm glad the president was killed? This is your first public statement in that 90-day period, is it not? First time I opened up my mouth in 90 days. That's why I'm talking so fast and so hot. <laughs> <laughs> you, feel, you feel, however, that uh, that we're making progress in, in this country? No, and we're no, like, no, no. Uh -huh. I will never say that progress is being made. If you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. Mm -hmm. If you pull it all the way out, that's not progress. The progress is healing the wound that the blow, that the blow made. And they haven't even begun to pull a knife out, much less try and pull, uh, heal the wound. You have, have, you have they won't even admit the knife is there. Do <laughs> you have any <laughs> prediction you'd like to make? No. When we'll solve this? Cassius makes all the predictions. In the 90 days that I've been silent, I have come to the conclusion that uh, I can best help spread the solution that the, and the diagnosis that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gives of the so-called Negro problem in this country by continuing to remain out of the nation of Islam and working on my own without restriction in the way that I think I best know how. In March of 1964, Malcolm formed his own organization, Muslim Mosque Incorporated. And in April of 1964, Malcolm went to Africa. Malcolm, what is your purpose here? Well, my purpose here is to remind the uh, African heads of the state that there are 22 million of us in America who are also of African descent, and to remind them also that we are the victims of uh, America's colonialism or American imperialism, and that our problem is not an American problem, it's a human problem. It's not a Negro problem, it's a problem of humanity. It's not a problem of civil rights, but a problem of human rights. And what do you hope for from this conference? Well, we hope to uh, bring pressure upon them, or rather we hope to impress upon them the importance of their bringing pressure and world opinion upon the United States to take some meaningful effort to solve our problem in America. We want them to help us get our problem before the United Nations and charge America with violating our human rights in the same way that South Africa is charged with violating the human rights of our people in that area. And what uh, sort of reaction have you been getting from the African leaders? Well, I've gotten a good reaction, a very sympathetic reaction, and an understanding reaction. Many of them have been misinformed by the American government into thinking that uh, black people in America don't identify with Africa, and therefore they've restrained themselves from voicing uh, their interest in our problem. But I've, I've impressed upon them that our problem is their problem, as well as their problem to our problem. And then to Egypt. After his pilgrimage to Mecca, he wrote a letter stating that many white people he met displayed a spirit of unity and brotherhood that provided him with a new, positive insight into race relations. Uh, when I was in, on the pilgrimage, I had close contact 
with Muslims whose skin would in America be classified as white and with Muslims who themselves would be classified as white in America. But these particular Muslims didn't call themselves white. They looked upon themselves as human beings, as part of the human family, and therefore they looked upon all other segments of the human family as part of that same family. Well, now, uh, they had a different look or a different air or a different attitude than that which is uh, reflected in the uh, attitude of the man in America who calls himself white. So I said that if uh, Islam had done this, done that for them, perhaps if the white man in America would study Islam, perhaps they could do the same thing for him. In Islam, he now feels lies the power to overcome racial antagonism and to obliterate it from the heart of white America. I'm going to use to prove that you can uh, use new legislation and change the conditions that our people face in the South. So instead of legislation, in my opinion, it takes education. The, the whites have to be re-educated. Uh, so that the racism that they have in their heart can be eliminated and the, and our people have to be re-educated uh, so that we will know how to do something for ourselves instead of waiting for others to do it for us all the time. Well, how will that re-education be brought about? Uh, well, just as uh, uh, in, the, in World War II, this country could use its uh, news media to propagandize and make, our, make the whole American public uh, love the love the Germans and the Japanese, and rather love the Russians and the Chinese and hate the Germans and the Japanese. And then after the war, they changed it and made the American public love the, uh, the Germans and love the Japanese, hate the Russians and hate the Chinese, which shows that they can make the American public love whom they will and hate whom they will. And that same process can be used to re-educate the American public and show white people how to love black people and show black people how to do something to stand on our own feet and solve our own problems. The black man doesn't have to be taught to love the white man. The white man has to be taught to love the black man. Uh, at least, do you think the Civil Rights Bill, uh, when it's passed, uh, is a sign of better times for Negroes in this country? No. Uh, as I said before, the legislation won't solve our problems. New York City has all of the laws. It has FEPC. And still, there's job discrimination in this city. Uh, laws doesn't solve... That, that, law, that type of law doesn't solve the problem. Uh, and it's the same with education. It actually, t it's, the same, it's the same with the segregated educational system. Uh, it's, it, it exists here the same as it exists in the South. Now, the law here is on the side of an integrated school system, but you still don't have an integrated school system. What do you think of Senator Goldwater's stand on the Civil Rights Bill? Well, he's probably being more honest than uh, the other politicians are. He's, uh, even though uh, his stand is the wrong stand, and, and it's uh, an unjust stand. Still, he's being more honest than the other white politicians are. I don't think that uh, in, in his heart, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson's stand is any different from Goldwater's stand. Lyndon B. Johnson is taking a stand that is for political expediency. And it's the same with all of the so-called liberal element. It's political expediency, politics. This change of heart divides Malcolm further from the nation of Islam in America as they continue to preach about the white man being the devil and stopping the American Negro from advancing in society. He says there are probably less than 7,000 members now in the Muslim. Well, it has uh, fallen apart. Uh, no, thank you. It has fallen apart. And dissatisfied black Americans are now free to participate into the full swing of the struggle that's going on in this country, and I think it will be inclined to step up the tempo. Are they in your movement? Sure. Every movement. <laughs> You have to read the history of slavery to understand this. There were two kinds of Negroes. There was that old house Negro and the field Negro. Hold the light high. And the house Negro always looked out for his master. When the field Negro got too much out of line, he held them back in check. He put them back on the plantation. Talk to the slaves. They didn't kill them. They sent some old house Negro along behind him to undo what he said. Because he, because he lived better than the field Negro. He ate better, he dressed better, and he lived in a better house. He lived right up next to his master in the attic or the basement. He ate the same food his master ate and wore his same clothes. And he could talk just like his master. master. Good diction. And he loved his master more than his master loved himself. That's why he didn't want his master to hurt. If the master got sick, he'd say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. He was <laughs> Trying to put the fire out. He didn't want his master's house burned. 
He never wanted his master's property threatened. And he was more defensive of it than the master was. That was the house Negro. But then you had some field Negro who lived in huts, had nothing to lose. They wore the worst kind of clothes. They ate the worst food. And they caught hell. They felt the sting of the lash. They hated their master. Oh, yes, they did. If the master got sick, they prayed that the master died. <laughs> If the master's house caught fire, they prayed for a strong wind to come along. <laughs> this was the difference between the two. And today you still have house Negroes and field Negroes. <laughs> I'm a field Negro. If I can't live in the house as a human being, I'm praying for a wind to come along. <laughs> if the master won't treat me right and he's sick, I'll tell the doctor to go in the other direction. <laughs> but if all of us are going to live as human beings, as brothers, then I'm for a society of human beings that can practice brotherhood. <laughs> then you and I are within our rights to wire Secretary General Ustam of the United Nations and charge the federal government in this country behind Lyndon B. Johnson with being derelict in its duty to protect the human rights of 22 million black people in this country. And in, and in their failure to protect our human rights, they are violating the United Nations Charter, and they are not qualified to continue to sit in that international body and talk about what human rights should be done in other countries on this earth. But before I sit down, I want to thank you for listening to me. I hope I haven't put anybody on the spot. I'm not intending to try and stir you up and make you do something that you wouldn't have done anyway. <laughs> I pray that God will bless you in everything that you do. I pray that you will grow intellectually, so that you can understand the problems of the world and where you fit into in that world picture. And I pray that all the fear that has ever been in your heart will be taken out. And when you look, when you look at that man, if you know he's nothing but a coward, you won't fear him. If he wasn't a coward, he wouldn't gang up on him. He wouldn't need to On June 7, 1964, Malcolm sponsors a rally at the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem and in answer to a question from the audience, Malcolm stated that Elijah Muhammad is the father of six illegitimate children from his teenage secretaries. On June 15, 1964, Malcolm attended an eviction trial because Elijah was trying to get Malcolm and his family out of the house owned by the Nation of Islam. Again, he stated the fact of the illegitimate children fathered by Elijah Muhammad. Uh, it has been a uh, well-known fact uh, though only in the form of rumor uh, that uh, there has been a great deal of uh, apprehension at my being out of the black Muslim movement on the part of the black Muslims themselves. And I had uh, stated in a newspaper article about an effort to take my life back in January, and at that time the Muslims denied it. In fact, they tried to make it appear to my brother that I was insane. But on a program in Chicago called Hotline, this moder moderated by Wesley South, John Ali, the national secretary, admitted, uh, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday, one of these days last week, that they absolutely were going to kill me. Why are they threatening your life? Well, uh, primarily because they're afraid that I will tell the real reason that they've been, that I'm out of the black Muslim movement, which I never told, I kept to myself. But the real, real reason is that Elijah Muhammad, the head of the movement, is the father of eight children by six different teenage girls. Different, uh, six different teenage girls who were his private personal secretary. Uh, four of them had one child apiece by him. Uh, two of them had two children, and one of those two is pregnant right now in Los Angeles uh, with their his th uh, third child. And uh, the, uh, the one who first made me aware of this was Wallace Muhammad, Mr. Muhammad's son. And it was uh, their fear that uh, if I remained in the black Muslim movement, and this came into the knowledge, 
of his followers that they would leave him and follow me. So uh, a, a plan immediately was set in motion to uh, take me down, put me out, and uh, the statement that I allegedly made, or not that I allegedly made, I did make it, the statement that I made about Kennedy was used as a, a pretext to take me down. But in reality, it was, it was because I had come to New York and told Joseph, the captain in New York, and uh, the secretary and the minister in Boston about these children that Mr. Muhammad had. And it was that, that right there was the real reason for my being out of the movie. Did you what get steps out of will you take to protect yourself from this threat? I take no steps. I have a rifle. If anybody comes to my house without a good reason, I, I intend to try and use it. Uh, and that's all. On February 14th, 1965, Malcolm's house was firebombed. Neither Malcolm, his wife, or children were injured in the blast. On February 21st, 1965, Malcolm was to speak at the Audubon Ballroom. He requested police protection, but the police refused and only had police on the outside of the building. The FBI, the CIA, the police, and Elijah Muhammad all wanted Malcolm eliminated. Is your life in danger from the Muslims and Elijah Muhammad's group? Well, Elijah Muhammad uh, has given the order to his followers to see that I am crippled or killed. I was sitting in the first row when Malcolm came out. Uh, the stand had been turned over to him by uh, the introductory speaker, and he raised his hand in uh, the Muslim greeting, Salam Alaikum, like this, his right hand. <laughs> At that point, a uh, rumbling broke out behind us, and everybody in the place naturally turned around to look. You understand that the situation was tense because of the bombing of Malcolm's house and so forth. And uh, everybody jumped up to look, and of course, I remember a chair was, had been knocked over back there. And uh, I saw two guys, like, looking at the floor. And then, my next impression was, I, I, I turned around to look at Malcolm, and I remember him saying, stay calm, stay cool. And I remember hearing over my right shoulder the, the gunfire. And uh, then Malcolm's hand was up like that, uh, in, still in the greeting, and still uh, exhorting everybody to stay calm when he fell backwards in a dead faint. He just slumped. We have two suspects in custody now. Well, Where were they who fired the shot? I wouldn't know that at this time. Where were they arrested, sir? One of uh, these men uh, was arrested uh, on the street by one of our patrolmen close by. There were no police at this meeting, were there, Inspector? There were no uniformed policemen assigned inside this hall. What about the skirmish that apparently took place before? What has that got to do with the apparent killing? It might have been a diversionary tactic. Then what about well, the organization? Right. What about the organization, Sister Betty? Do you, do you feel it? It, it was that Malcolm had set it up well enough for it to carry on. Will they have a counselor who will take his place? Do you have any idea now? Well, at present, I'd rather not make any comments about the organization or Muslim Mosque Incorporated. I know it's a little personal, but you have the children to to consider now. Yes. What What do you What can you see for it now? Any, any plans at this time? Now, may I just interrupt you to say that yes, she has children now. She has four. Yes. The interesting thing is that she is now in the first month of a new pregnancy yes. as well. And I think you ought to know also that striking back to the question of the bombing of his house, yes. he not only was without insurance, was without any money at all. And they tried and to say that he was getting money from uh, China and places of that sort, which yes. was ridiculous. What are your plans, then, for the, for the future? It's rather ironic that you had planned to meet with him this coming Friday, had you, Mr. Sutton? Malcolm was to make a will this Friday. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much, Mrs. Thank Shabazz. Thank you. Thomas Hagen was arrested outside the ballroom and charged with murder. We had, uh, had not, as I said, never resorted to no such thing as violence. The uh, way I see it, uh, Malcolm uh, is the victim of his own preaching. He preached violence, and so he became the victim of it. Would you say flatly that no black Muslims were involved in the shooting of Malcolm X? I wasn't there, but I don't believe that any of my followers were there. It had nothing to do with it at all. Because we don't even know this person. Who do you think uh, might have done it, and who would have had reason? 
I don't know. I have to talk. Mr. Harlan, are you in fear of your own life? No, sir. On February 26th, Norman 3X Butler was arrested and charged with Malcolm's murder, and Thomas 15X Johnson was arrested seven days later and also charged with murder. On March 11, 1966, Hare, Butler, and Johnson were convicted of murder in the first degree, and on April 14, 1966, all three were sentenced to life imprisonment. The way that I got involved, Bob indicates, as I said earlier, was because of the conflict between Malcolm and Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And um, there were certain statements that Malcolm had made in regards to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Accusations uh, that uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had uh, fathered children by other women, things like this here. Uh, a lot of uh, other statements that was being made. And most of the Muslims at the time actually felt that uh, Malcolm was slandering the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that uh, he was defaming him, that he was lying. That morning, I would say really uh, to the night before, me and uh, the other individuals that I mentioned, um, we had decided that uh, we was going to um, move on Malcolm. We was going to um, kill him if we possibly could uh, on the 21st. And uh, he drew up a strategy. How uh, he was going to uh, go into the ballroom, where he was going to sit, and uh, what he was going to do. And um, knowing that there would be a crowd there, we figured that uh, it was possible that we could do it. That's what we did. On May 29, 1980, Congressman W. Hughes of New Jersey writes FBI Director Webster and asks that he look into the assassination of Malcolm X. On June 20th, 1980, Assistant Director Revelle writes to Hughes to explain that the FBI has no new information. The FBI files on Malcolm X remain closed today. Ossie Davis delivered the eulogy at Malcolm's funeral. His poetry spoke for millions. Here, at this final hour, in this quiet place, Harlem has come to bid farewell to one of its brightest hopes. Extinguished now and gone from us forever. For Harlem is where he worked and where he struggled and fought. There are those who will consider it their duty as friends of the Negro people to tell us to revile him, to flee even from the presence of his memory, to save ourselves by writing him out of the history of our turbulent times. Many will ask what Harlem finds to honor in this stormy, controversial, and bold young captain, and we will smile. Many will say, turn away, away from this man, for he is not a man, but a demon, a monster, and an enemy of the black man, and we will smile. They will say that he is of hate, a fanatic, a racist, who can only bring evil to the cause for which he struggles. And we will answer and say unto them, did you ever talk to Brother Malcolm? Did you ever touch him? Or have him smile at you? Did you ever really listen to him? Did he ever do a mean thing? Was he ever himself associated with violence or any public disturbance? For if you did, you would know him. And if you knew him, you would know why we must honor him. Malcolm was our manhood, our living black manhood. This was his meaning to his people. And in honoring him, we honor the best in ourselves. However much we differed with him or even with each other about him as his value as a man, that his going from us serve only to bring us together now. Consigning these mortal remains to earth, the common mother of all, securing the knowledge that what we place in the ground is no more now a man, but a seed, which after the winter of our discontent will come forth again to meet us. And we shall know him then for what he was and is. 
a prince. Our own black shining prince who did not hesitate to die because he loved us so much. Who are you? Yeah. You don't know. Right. Don't tell me Negro, that's nothing. That's right. What were you before the white man named you a Negro? Right. And where were you? Right. And what, right. what tongue did you speak? Right. How did the man take your tongue? Right. Where is your history? Right. How did the man wipe out your history? Right. How did the man, what did the man do to make you as dumb yes, right. as you are right now? <laughs> If you can't do for yourself what the white man is doing for himself, don't say you're equal with the white man. Right. If you can't set up a factory like he sets up a factory, don't talk that old equality talk. Do you consider yourself militant? <laughs> I consider myself Malcolm. <laughs>